HBCU Digest, welcome back. Uh, distinguished interviews and perspectives from leading uh, experts in and around the HBCU community. Today, a very special guest, Dr. Cynthia Colon. She is an associate professor of sociology with an appointment in public health at The Ohio State University and the lead author and researcher on a, a pretty interesting study recently that makes connections between the health outcomes uh, of black students or black college students and black graduates and whether or not they attend HBCU. So eager, eager, eager to get into this one. So Dr. Colin, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. So your your research, um, and this is done in tandem with a postdoc fellow uh, and a graduate student uh, yep. in your department, uh, suggests that, or at least makes connections between responses of black students from predominantly white institutions and HBCUs and it, it the 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 takeaway is that black students who have graduated from HBCUs have better health outcomes uh, later on past graduation. Can you kind of explain? And I guess the question that's on everybody's mind: How does where you go to school right. impact your health? Right. So um, actually, uh, in this study, we uh, we were able to use an existing data set. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, which is known in 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 my circles as ad health so um it's the national longitudinal survey of adolescent health and well-being um and what this data set does is it began in the mid 1990s uh and it interviewed individuals um a very very diverse set racially and ethnically diverse set of individuals who were in grades 7 through 12 in the mid 1990s and it's followed them over time um and they've had five interviews now. Uh, and at, at the third interview at wave three, um, they were the age at which most people attend college. So most ad health um, respondents were in their late teens through their mid twenties. Um, and they collected a lot of information about where they went to school, if they went to school. Um, and we not we not only had data from the respondents themselves about where they went to college, we also had data from the institutions um, about uh, you know various um, various make up, uh, characteristics about those institutions of higher learning. And one of the questions we were able to tap into was if the respondent went to college, did they go to an HBCU or to a PWI, a predominantly white institution? And so we were able to look at a subset of black respondents who either went to an HBCU or to a PWI. And what we found was that uh, African-Americans who went to an HBCU uh, had a 35% lower um, odds of developing metabolic syndrome in midlife. So not, not at wave three, but in subsequent waves. Um, and, uh, you know, this study, right, we, were, we weren't able to really drill down into exactly why this was happening. Unfortunately, because we were using an existing data set, um, we had to go with what was available in the data. But I did have some hypotheses. Um, and the biggest one is that when you go to an HBCU, right, uh, you are just in an environment where exposure to racial discrimination is likely to not be as um, as prevalent. Um, and, you know, not only are you less likely to encounter instances of unfair treatment because of your race and ethnicity, right, both at the individual level and at the institutional and systemic level, um, but also at HBCUs, you're able to have access to uh, you know, mentors and faculty and older students, right? More advanced students who are of the same race and ethnicity as you are. Um, so, so what we know is that HBCUs are a wonderful driver of upward socioeconomic mobility. And this study suggests there are other benefits of attending an HBCU for African-Americans. Are there any existing or in the works research that that talk about the impact of stress uh in african americans and specifically on the different environs in which we live and work right um because i think that 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 makes a lot of sense if you're not stressed early if you're not stressed you you likely won't have you know intractable diseases um because yep. your body's just not reacting to stress but i, I find it very very interesting 
that this is the second study in, you know, in a couple years that that says HBCU graduates are happier when they go to HBCUs mm -hmm. and now they're healthier when they right. go to HBCUs. And you're talking about a time in your life where you're young and <laughs> to be frank, don't care about a lot of that stuff. <laughs> so why, why do you think that that this data keeps right. showcasing in different with different people, different surveys that all relevant, you know, all kind of all tie back to stress mm -hmm. at a young age in life? Yeah, so there's a, there's a huge literature um, in sociology, in public health, in psychology that shows uh, being exposed to discrimination or unfair treatment uh, definitely activates our stress response, right? And not only does it activate our stress response in that moment, it actually has a long-term effect on our bodies, right? On our bodies and minds over time. Um, and so it, it uh, predominantly works through inflammation. So when your stress response is continually activated, let's say because you encounter racial discrimination frequently, um, it, it has a hard time shutting off. And because of this, right, you tend to have inflammation in your body um, in a more widespread fashion, right? And this can lead to worse mental and physical health outcomes over time across the life course. Um, and that was one of the things about our study is there are a few studies that have looked at the health of HBCU attendees, um, either in and amongst themselves or comparing them to uh, people who are enrolled at PWIs and looks at their current mental or physical health status while they're in college. Ours is one of the few studies that were able to follow people over time and see, you know, compared to uh, African Americans who went to a PWI, were uh, African Americans who went to an HBCU, were they less likely to develop um, worse health outcomes later on, right, over time? How do you counter for, or is there any, is there any allowance for um, just the fact that genetics may play a role in the kind of illnesses and diseases you may get? Yeah, so I get this question a lot um, about genetics. And what I will say is that the science is pretty clear, right? On the population level, right? When we see um, an elevated risk of worse health, among certain groups of people, especially when we're looking at racial disparities in health, um, whether it's metabolic syndrome, which we looked at, at in this paper or other health outcomes, we really can't um, explain it due to genetic differences, right? When, when you're looking at an individual's health risk, then genetics in terms of you know, your risk because of your family background, your first degree relatives can come into play. But when we're looking at these population level outcomes, it's not due to genetics. It's due to the environments within which we live, we go to school, we work, right? What do you think that this research uh, or how does it lend itself to, to more expanded analysis? Uh, I know you mentioned before, um, while this compares black students at PWIs and at HBCUs, it is a broader look uh, to just say all students of all races. Is it more minorities or What's the next logical step for the research? Right. Um, so one thing I really want to do is I want to drill down into what are the mechanisms, right? What are the pathways that might lead to um, African-American students at HBCUs having better health um, over the long term compared to African-American students at PWIs? Um, you know, and as they move through successive life course stages, right, as they move into midlife, maybe as they move into later ages. Why? Why is this happening? Um, you know, is it because of this exposure to racial discrimination? Is it because of being able to be in more supportive environments where they're able to have access to more pathways to upward mobility, right? One thing we know is that the association between socioeconomic status and health is very, very strong. Um, so is this primarily working through SES or is it working through other mechanisms? Um, and then, you know, how much of it is it, it being in a supportive environment, right? Where you don't have to doubt yourself or doubt what people are thinking of you day in and day out. And then the final question, um, you know, obviously your, your research and as a, as an academic, you're not, you're not 
involved in, oh, how will this impact recruitment? Or how does this impact, you know, what kind of students do different schools recruit? But, you know, obviously it's the kind of information that that some schools or other schools could use in saying this is how we will persuade or dissuade a student from from to come to our school or to not go to another school. Uh, do you think that that's a fair usage of the research or the research? Or is this just something to understand this is this is a, an outcome for, you know, black folks uh, when we're talking about college attendance or is mm -hmm. it, it, it do you look at it as something like, yes, it's it's a fair point to say this is why one school is better than another. Um, I think, you know, when we're looking at sort of overall policies that impact higher education, absolutely. Should people consider these findings? Yes, for sure. You know, with the with the um, obvious caveats, it's one study. It needs to be replicated um, in different populations, you know, and, and, and in different research by different researchers. Um, and we have to get a better sense of what is it about the environment at an HBCU that is particularly health protective. But I think when we're talking about large policies, you know, we're having a lot of conversations right now about higher education and how to financially support higher education and where should we put our money in terms of how much bang for our buck we, sh we can get. And I think, you know, if we can say, look, HBCUs not only are they great drivers of upward mobility, right, along with community colleges, but there might be a health protective effect that is sort of the gift that keeps on giving in terms of physical health over time. That's a great support and, and kind of argument for continued support of HBCUs. I think also in terms of kind of public policy, it points to predominantly white institutions doing a better job, not only with recruiting a diverse student body, but supporting them actively, right? Carefully, um, uh, enthusiastically while they're at college um, and know that doing so might not, in, might not only increase um, and improve outcomes, educational outcomes among a racial and ethnically diverse student body, it might also improve their health over time. Dr. Colin, Ohio State University, we appreciate your time today. All right. Thank you very much for having me.